deliberately called your book Enhancing Evolution and the ethical case for making better human. Um, actually, what you say is we should take evolution in our own hands. Evolution has been um, going on forever since life first emerged on this planet. And human beings emerged between five and seven million years ago. And in that evolutionary period, um, we've ended up with us. But we are not the end point. Further evolution will inevitably take place. And the issue must be whether we try to influence that process or whether we don't. Now, since evolution up to now has been random and has not been designed to produce wonderful, healthy beings, it's ended up by producing remarkable creatures like you and me and everybody listening to what we're saying. But it could produce more remarkable creatures still. And I'm anxious that it does produce more remarkable creatures still, creatures well adapted to be happy, healthy, and to make the world a better place. But it could produce creatures uh, rather different. So I think we have a moral responsibility, if we can, to influence that process. Yeah. But you say, actually, we should replace natural selection with deliberate selection? I believe so, yes. Replace Darwinian selection with enhancement selection? If, certainly, if we can. We can do so to only a limited extent at the moment. But if we can, we certainly should. And of course, we have been doing this. Um, Darwinian selection has, um, has lost a lot of its influence. And we've sort of got stuck in the state that we are now. Um, it suggests a little bit that nature has done a lousy job. Well, nature has done a mixed job. I mean, uh, obviously, there are many wonderful things about human beings as we are today. But nature has also left us very vulnerable in many, many uh, unpleasant ways. We are vulnerable to disease, to injury, to premature death. Um, and all of these things are, you might think, mixed blessings. I would think that we should try as hard as we can to eradicate some of these vulnerabilities, or indeed as many of them as we can. But enhancement also has something um, make it even more better than we, than them better, let's say. Well, of course, yes. Uh, um, Enhancement also has the connotation that we will be better than any human, we could be better than any human beings have been before. And in a sense, we already are. Uh, anybody who has been vaccinated, for example, against polio, against smallpox, against measles, mumps and rubella, is better than any human being was before vaccination because they are immune to diseases which humans had never been immune to before the 18th century. So what you actually say is, we are already enhancing ourselves. We have always been enhancing ourselves. If you take another example, take um, the capacity to, um, to speak language and to write it down. That was a huge enhancement te technology. It enabled recorded history to begin. It enabled us to have a sense of ourselves in a, in a, with a sort of continuity that was never before achieved. But that's a sort of cultural enhancement, isn't it? Enhancing people? Well, of course it's enhancing people because it gives us knowledge and access to knowledge which we can utilize that we'd never had before. Or take something very simple, take uh, using uh, glasses, spectacles. Uh, I use reading glasses. Uh, before, the, b before this invention, I, somebody like me at my age would no longer be able to read, but I can. So actually, could you say that uh, enhancement is eagle to improvement? Absolutely, yes. I use enhancement in the sense of improvement, yes. Yeah. Um, and that's a steady process, and it, and it is in principle limitless. Yeah. And we humans are enhancing beings. We always do it, and we always have. Yeah. But now the tools, the scientific tools of enhancing people are rather unlimited, you would always say. They are in principle unlimited. And what this means is that probably for the first time in our history, we can think seriously about influencing the course of evolution. Evolution up to now, Darwinian evolution, has been a random process. And as I say, it's produced some benefits and some burdens for us. It's left us in a very mixed state. For the first time, we can actually contemplate 
uh, nudging this process in directions that we think would be desirable. Darwinian evolution only operates uh, until you can reproduce, and now people are living much longer. Most humans live long enough to reproduce, and it's sort of after their reproductive years that things start going wrong. So if we want to increase um, our life expectancy, for example, as many people do, and we want to increase other, um, augment other features uh, of ourselves, we will have to intervene in that process in order to, to secure those advantages. In order to secure old age or to change in, in old... In order to reliably secure old age. Many of us live into old age, but many do not. I would like to see more people living long and healthy lives. And to do that, I think we will have to intervene in evolution. And it's a moral obligation. You see it as a moral obligation. I, be I believe that doing good is a moral obligation. And in so far as we can agree that enhancing human beings is doing good, then of course it is a moral obligation. But then many people would say, let's not mess with nature. Well, people who say let's not mess with nature uh, don't go to the doctor. They never enter a hospital. They never go to a dentist. The whole business of medicine, the whole industry of therapeutics, of drugs and so forth, is there to frustrate the course of nature because we naturally fall ill, we naturally die prematurely, we are naturally a prey to viruses, to bacteria, and to all sorts of things. When we intervene in that process, we are f interfering, intervening in frustrating the course of nature. And we are, if you like, playing gods. Yeah, but then you could say that is preventing disease. That's a non-natural state, I don't know although probably disease is also a natural state. But then you could say we could prevent disease um, or, or cure disease. That's quite different from really enhancing people. Suppose they are good as they are and then enhancing them. Well, obviously there will be debate about this distinction between therapy and enhancement, between um, repairing damage and enhancing functioning. But I believe that there is a continuum, that these things shade imperceptibly uh, one into another. And indeed now the very processes that are therapeutic processes are also enhancement processes. For example, life expectancy has increased dramatically in the last 50 years uh, in most of the uh, industrialized countries. And it will probably continue to increase. But still, um, you could say you use all those kind of things. It has all those, uh, whether it's enhancement, whether it's improvement or not. Um, if you compare it, for example, to sports, they are using doping, uh, all kind of uh, uh, steroids to, to, to enhance their abilities. Um, now we are going to genetically engineer the sportsman. So you get genetic doping. We are at the stage where we... Um, genetic engineering is, is yet another step. And um, we would have to talk about what genetic engineering means. Uh, tinkering with the genes, making interventions in the genome is a very problematic process. And at the moment, it's... Um, in terms of deliberate interventions, actually doing genetic engineering is very dangerous and problematic, and no sane person would recommend that for sports. And indeed, in many cases, not for health um, either. However, in the future, it may be easier. Now, there are other things that we do which do change the genes. Actually, there is evidence that what we eat changes our genetic makeup, certainly um, epigenetic features. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's quite age. different, of course. You, you, you're right, we, we eat things and that changes our... and we, we experience things, which probably change our genes as well, but deliberately changing our genes. Because in your book, you actually um, state that there's no ethical reason not to do it. Well, there is no... Let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I was at a stem cell conference in Singapore, and I heard a presentation by... David Baltimore, who is a Nobel Prize winning scientist and he's the president of Caltech, the California Institute of Technology. And he described work in his lab, which is attempting to engineer 
into genes, into cells, resistance to HIV and to cancer by creating new cells which have never before been in a human individual, which are, would be new to the human genome. Now, the ethical question is, should we wish him and his lab success in this venture, which might enable us to make humans resistant to HIV and to cancer, or should we hope he fails because it would be unethical to meddle with the genes? Now, I don't think there is anything in principle unethical about meddling with the genes if we can do it safely. And in the case of Baltimore, David Baltimore, if we can do it for a massively useful and beneficial purpose, improving our resistance to HIV and to AIDS. But that seems pretty clear because then you have a disease, you eradicate a disease. Um, that's something you call improvement. But then you change human nature as well because yes. you change the vulnerability for uh, um, cancer or for yes. HIV. Well, I, I don't think, again, I don't think there's anything in principle wrong with changing human nature. We do it all the time. We have continued to do it since we evolved. I mean, we, you have to also remember that we are the products of radical changes in the constitution of our forebears. We are all, as we know, descended from ape ancestors in Africa about five to seven million years ago. And so we, radical changes have already taken place. We, a very large percentage of our genes we share with animals and indeed with fruits. We share about 50% of our genes with bananas, about 95% of our genes with chimpanzees. And this indicates that our nature has evolved, as we know, and has changed radically over a long period of time. 